Okay, Steve, uh, please. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, yep, my name's Steve, and uh, I fell pretty passionately in love with the game of Go a little over nine years ago. Um, and I've done this talk and the other one, a couple others, a, a couple times before, and um, have enjoyed it a lot. So I, I was a high school teacher for my first act and then was an engineer at GE for a while. And these days I, I crawl around in databases for a company. Um, but like I said, about nine years ago, I got an interest in the game and I have uh, worked my way up to a reasonably strong amateur player. Um, but I'll, I'll go in to explain all of that. The other thing I'll say is um, I invite you to interrupt me with questions. I have no problem with that. Just speak up. Um, I will pause occasionally and ask if you have questions, but I just want you to feel free to, to join in and ask whatever, whenever. So let me see if I can share my screen, if I can find the right spot for that. They have more buttons on Zoom than they used to. Where is it? Nope, that's not right. On the bottom, you have the green, green one. If you see the green there one. There it is. Yeah, the one that's lit up so I can find it easily. Yeah, no, I, I totally missed that. Okay, hold on just a moment then. I'm just going to share the screen. Yeah. And the other thing I will say is while I'm doing this, um, I can't really see the chat or hands raised either. So, um, Jason, if you want to ping in, if somebody gets on the chat and says something and, and interrupt and, and ask their question for them, that would be totally fine. Um, can I move this out? Oh, yeah, I can move that over a little bit. Okay, so then let me get into presentation mode. There we go. So are you seeing the whole screen filled with the uh, title now? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so... Yes, the game of Go, and as someone pointed out, in China it is Wei Qi, and in Korea it's Baduk, and in Japan it's actually Igo, um, but as it's made its way into the U.S., we tend to refer to it as Go, but it came to us mostly through uh, Japan, and I'll, I'll get into all of that. Um, so what is this game? So it is a two-person, turn-based, deep strategy game. And the goal is you are trying to control more of the board than the other person. I'm going to show you some examples here in a minute to kind of clarify what that means. Someone likened it to chess, and it is in that it's like a deep strategy kind of game. Um, but the rules are very different, and the feel of it is very different. In chess, you're trying to trap and kill your opponent. In Go, you are building territory. You're, you're trying to balance how far can I reach out to take territory without being beaten back. There's a, there's a very, there's a balance feel to it that I love. Um, the rules are very simple and the consequences are very complex. There's a saying that uh, it takes you 15 minutes to learn how to play and the rest of your life to learn how to play well. I'd like to see if I can totally get that out of my way. There, that's pretty bad. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's it's very complex. It's a very, very deep game. Um, it has a ranking system uh, that starts with 30Q. And a 30Q person, You most of you are probably 30Q. You've never heard of the game before. You've never seen the game. You don't really know the rules. It goes 29, 28, 27, 26, et cetera. Um, and, you know, after you have learned the rules and played one or two games, you're already down to a 25 Q. You'll pretty rapidly work yourself down to a 20. Till after a year or so, maybe, if you keep playing, you'll probably be around a 10 Q. I've been playing for about nine years. I'm only down to five. Um, and uh, go down to one Q. And then it goes from one Q to one Don, up to seven Don. And then above that, there's one Don Professional up to nine Don Professional. Nine Don Professional are the best players in the world, and there are not that many of them. Um, so you get a sense of how expansive this game is. 
you know, a, we're in a club here in Cincinnati. I'm like, I can beat one person. Another person can beat me. Another person can beat them. There's this, this chain. But there's a really nice handicap system that lets you play even against somebody that's a very different skill level than you. And the handicap system is such that it makes it uh, very challenging for both of you. Um, it uses deductive, inductive, and intuitive decision making. The deductive, they, they, they talk about reading and go, and you really are saying, okay, if I move here, they're going to have to do that, and then I'll be able to do this, and they're going to need to respond that way. Very deductive line of thinking. There's also inductive, because there are some patterns that you'll see, and I've seen these stones in this shape before on the board. Last time I played there, and it didn't go well. So this time, let me try something else. There's in this inductive experience that you have playing the game. And there's very much an intuitive decision making. The board is big. It's 19 by 19 squares, as you can see, or 19 by 19 positions, as you can see on this, this picture here. And sometimes the move is, ah, uh, that spot feels about right. Um, its biggest claim to fame to me, it is the oldest board game that's been continuously played under the same basic set of rules. Um, I do a, a demo sometimes when I'm in person. I do this the talk in person. I take a tape measure and I equate one inch to a decade. And so I did this with my uh, daughter's uh, class. I did a club in her high school once and you know told them, okay, so you guys are one and a half inches old. Um, I'm about five and a half inches old. The United States has been around for about two feet. Um, chess, you know, the venerable game of chess that everybody talks about is this ancient strategy game. It's only out at about 11 feet, 10 inches. It was uh, about uh, 600 ACE is around when chess got started. The Christian era, year zero in the Christian calendar. Uh, is uh, 16 feet down the line. And we're not, we're not nearly to go its beginnings yet. Uh, Confucius. Confucius, by the way, referred to it as the ancient game of Go. So to him, it was the ancient game. And he was around about 550 BCE, and that's at about 21 and a half feet. So by this time, when I do this demo in person, I'm working my way out of the conference room door into the hallway. And by the time you get to go, it's estimated to be about 3,500 years old. And that's 29 feet on that tape measure. Goes back a long way. Uh, there are some other games that are old too. If anybody, does anybody have think something they think might be a competitor with Go? All right, I won't make you talk. Um, I did want to, can I do this? Hold on, let me. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop because I'm, I'm having bandwidth and issues and I'm just going to turn my camera off because that tends to help that. There we go. Let me go back and share again. There we go. And go back to presentation mode. All right. So just how old is this game? This game has a legendary origin story, literally a legendary origin story. As the story goes, Emperor Yao is the predominant version of this story, who lived in about 2356 to 2255 BCE. Um, he was considered to be one of the five emperors preceding the end. I'm going to apologize in advance. My Chinese pronunciation will be garbage. So apologize to Jason and others. Um, you can feel free to correct me. I think that is the Jia dynasty. Um, but I do not do Chinese vowels or intonations well at all. And I will apologize in advance. The Xi dynasty itself is somewhat mythical. Um, it's kind of, it's talked about in books, but there's not a whole lot of uh, physical evidence of it. But the Emperor Yao is one of the five emperors preceding that. And the story goes that he had uh, a son who was just kind of unruly. He just wasn't, didn't have a lot of discipline. Dan Zhu. And he asked his 
and his advisors to create a game to teach his son discipline. There are various versions of this story. Um, some of them attribute it not to Yao, but to his uh, his uh, successor, Shun. In some stories, the son is unruly. In some stories, the son um, has mental difficulties. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a variety of stories. Some of them actually put the story back to the Yellow Emperor, which boots it back another 500 years. Um, the, the story appears in a lost book from the Warring States period. In other words, there's a book that says, hey, there's this other book that tells this story, but that book has since been lost. And variations on this story start to appear around the Han Dynasty uh, in about 206 to 228, to 226, 206 BCE to 220 AC. And, you know, the variations start to appear. There is something of a tradition in, in Chinese culture that if you want your, your, uh, your, your, your ruler to be, you know, well-respected, you try and attribute them back to the ancestors. And so there is, you know, some reason to believe that's part of how this legendary story may have come to be, is they're trying to say this, this game of Go that we respect has ancient origins, and so it should be respected. But nonetheless, that's that's the legendary origin story. Well, what do we know? What's a little harder? Evidence? What's the written evidence for this game? Um, there is a well-known historical narrative, which I will butcher the pronunciation of. Zhuo Zhuan, I suppose, is how that's pronounced. It refers to an event involving Go at 548 BCE. That, would, that historical narrative is pretty well established to be a historical narrative, not just stories. Um, and so that's probably the earliest re written reference, the earliest written reference that refers to a date when the game existed. Um, it's brought up in the Confucian commentaries. I always thought it was kind of interesting. So first of all, yeah, Confu Confucius referred to it as the ancient game of Go. What I learned was interesting because in the beginning, uh, early Confucius writings, like original Confucius writings, um, it really wasn't respected that much. It was referred to as this game, this sort of gambling pastime that you know shouldn't be respected. Um, and interestingly, a, a bit later, uh, by the time you get to the Confucian commentaries, um, it, it sort of turns around, and then 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 the game begins to get some level of, of veneration. The earliest written rules, which I have a picture of here at the left, and if you will please uh, ignore the uh, <coughs> uh, British Museum stamp, they've got all, they've got a hold of this document. Um, it, the earliest written rules that are known are from 557 A.C.E. roughly. And the translation, I mean, ancient Chinese is puzzling even to modern Chinese. It's very hard to interpret. This is a somewhat literal translation of one of the sentences. Go has stop road and two overflowing, stones more is winner. Which if you know the game, you can kind of you kind of see what that means from the rules as we understand them now. The game ends when everybody is kind of the board is kind of filled up with stones overflowing in the sense that there's not really any more moves that are going to do me any good. And like I said, the one who wins the game is the one who controls more of the board. And then later on, you may have heard of Go as one of the four arts. That tend, that kind of became established uh, a little bit later in the 9th century. So that's the written evidence. Well, what about archaeological evidence? There's a little bit of that. That goes back a little bit further. Um, there are tombs where what appear to be go stones, stones in two two colors, black stones and white stones, um, in are in in burial tombs. You know, a place of veneration of the dead presumed go player. Um, I list some other uh, ancient boards that were discovered in uh, in China, um, and. You know, assuming those are ghost stones, because it is true that there weren't evidence of boards in these in these earlier uh, burial sites, but assuming those are ghost stones, you know, the game was there in 1000 BC and, uh, you know, must have been reasonably well established if you're going to bury your loved ones with, with memories of it. So that kind of establishes it, would, would establish it back to 1000 BC. So that's, that's the 3,500 year number that is often quoted. 
think. Whoa, hold on. I'm hitting the wrong buttons. All right. I just messed that up. There we go. So, how old is the game? Um, the written evidence certainly takes it back to around 500 BCE and, and is established at that point because they're talking about it in written sources. Um, so that's uh, 2,500 years. The archaeological evidence probably throws it back up, up, you know, maybe another thousand. Again, this was in 1040 BCE, but it's already pretty well established by then. So that's 3,500 years. If you believe the legends, tack on another 500 or another uh, almost 1,000, actually. And if you believe it's the Yellow Emperor version of the of the uh, legend, tack on another 500. So how old is the game? Most people quote it as 25 to 3,500 years old based on the, the written and archaeological evidence. Um, I'll pause there. Any any questions on the 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 ancient origins of the of the game? I, I do see a thing that says someone's hand is raised. Madeline, please go right ahead. I'm yes, unmuting. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Steve. This is great so far. Um, this is just a comment. I remember um, quite a few years ago now, I was looking at um, what the world's earliest maps were that have been preserved. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them are from China. And one of them was a the grid map. They invented the grid map, in other words, like a Cartesian grid. Um, but instead of having things flowing along through it uh, organically, the way geography does, they had actually abstracted the lines of rivers and boundaries and roads, which at the time seemed to me like, how? How did they even do this? And then when you had that first picture up on here, I was looking at the Go grid and I said, oh, because they had been looking at this and thinking about how things move along it in regular units. So it's an interesting cultural combination. Yep, they're definitely the grid to the board. Uh, looks like somebody else again. Just go ahead and speak up. I, I'm lucky at the moment a thing popped up where I could see people, but I can't yeah. necessarily do that. So, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, Dave and Tacoma here. I, I'm curious uh, when the earliest competitions might have been. I remember when I passed through Japan that they had serious competitions in the abacus. They, they, it, it, yes, very much so, and I am coming to that. Uh, if you'll wait a few more slides, I will. I will definitely get to that. And we have a Mark. Mark, please. Where's Mark? I think we lost him. Oh, no. Okay, uh, well. Yeah, he will be back. He probably driving. So <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, if there are no more questions about the early origins, I'm going to suggest we take a quick intermission and I show you a little bit about how the game is played, so you know what it is. Okay, we're talking okay. About. Uh, oh, I, I there can we ask go. A question now. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so I couldn't. I couldn't get my mute button to unmute. So that. No worries. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So um, based on the information you have there, it looks like what you have on the on the slide is that the oldest actual discovered board is from. Uh, 157 to 141 BC. Is that correct? Um, I believe that is the oldest one that I found reference to of a of a physical board. There's uh, right. Yeah, I think that is the older one. Yes. So, so as far as going on the theory that the black and white stones by themselves indicate the existence of the game, um, I got two questions about that. One, why would you bury the black and white stones without the board? Like, is there a plausible explanation for that? And two, is there an explanation for why there might be black and white stones independently of the game or possibly as precursors to the game? Is there a theory about that? Thank you. Absolutely. Very fair questions. Um, I, I don't know the first one. Um, was there simply not space? You know, you can see how crowded that picture is. I, maybe you, maybe you. Maybe the stones are easier to come by and you don't want to give up your board. I, I don't know the answer to that. 
And the answer to your second question is definitely maybe. You know, there were other games that may have involved stones. Do we know that those are ghost stones? Not necessarily, but they're about the right size. They're in two colors. Um, I believe I read in one spot that they were in about the right number. Um, you, you tend to have enough to fill a, a full go board. Um, at that point, they were smaller boards. But um, so they, it, those are very reasonable questions. And if you call those into question, you, you begin to believe this, this 1040 BCE number a little less, though we do pretty well know within 500 years of that, they're, you know, they're written, they're talking about events that involve go. So very fair questions. Yeah. Uh, you buy Steve, those or goes no. uh, Steve yeah. uh, let me try to answer Mark's question. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, first uh, about the why you have the uh the 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 chess the the goal but not the, the board. I believe the 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 break and the y is made by stone so it lasts longer and the, the board is made by wood so it rotten. That's that's my guess. Okay. That uh, could be. And uh, then white black and white, I probably you will associate with yin yang, okay, uh, the situation because that's uh, probably very uh, nature kind of thinking, you know, during the, uh, the history of China. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, that's just my my guess. Okay, and uh, then I think I will have CK his hands up. Yes, yeah, Steve, you showed us a uh, document from with a British Museum stamp on it. So how old is this document? Do you know? How old is the document? Yeah. It, it is this document. So it's been dated around 557 to 581 ACE. So this document is dated 557 ACE, and the British Museum put their stamp on the document. Like this. And so, and so whenever they collected it, yeah, I'm sure when it this went into the museum, they stamped it. Terrible vandalism. Indeed. I completely agree. I mean, what do you what do they think they're doing? They think they're the British the Empire, I suppose. No, I, I completely agree. I think it's awful, but you know, there it is nonetheless. Yeah, well, it's I guess uh they are no longer they shouldn't be the custodian of uh all these uh artifacts and documents based on what they did. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay, anything else? Or I can introduce us to the game itself a little bit, and then I'll go into the more recent history. Okay, let me get that out of that, and let me go over to this. All right, this this picture does not look like an actual game. The, you can think of these as little diagrams, just trying to show you how it's played. Um, these days, it is on a 19 by 19 board. You place the stones on the intersections, not in the squares, and the edges are valid places to put a board, put, put, a, put a stone. You take turns. Black usually goes first. White is usually the more experienced player by tradition. And um, if a stone, like this stone, it's mostly surrounded. If you think of these lines as roads, like a, like a downtown city, right now this black stone only has one way out of town. If white plays there, that stone gets captured. So that's one of the rules. So you're playing the stones turn by turn. You're trying to surround more area. I'm trying to surround territory, but... They're trying to surround me, and I'm trying to surround them, and if stones get totally surrounded, they get removed from the board. Same question, kind of thing here. Question, yes? significance to the, there's a few black dots. In yes. The so, those are called the star points, um, and they're there somewhat for visual reference. Um, they're all four lines out, one, two, three, four. There's also a tingin uh, in the middle, uh, stone in the middle. Um, they are, they're somewhat for visual reference. They're also where you place the handicap stones. Um, I mentioned that even if you're playing, it, so white is traditionally the stronger player. So if I'm playing someone much weaker than I am, they get to start with some black stones already on the board and those dark dots are where you place them. Okay, so continuing with the capturing rules, same sort of thing here. If I place a stone there, they're going to get taken. 
So how about these three? How many white stones is it going to take to capture those? What do you all think? Come on, somebody can make a guess. Any, anybody want to guess? I know the answer, but anybody want to guess? <laughs> Looks like 12. 12? Okay. okay Any no. other guesses? Okay, yeah. nine. Well, let's find out. So I have to block it in. So one, whoops, wrong color. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have to go back into game mode. And then that eighth one will actually kill it. So there are eight. You notice I didn't have to cut, I didn't have to surround it on the diagonal because there aren't any little streets going out that direction. So in that case, there were eight. How about this group? How many is it going to take to block off all of the exits for these? Give you a minute to think about it. Let's find Who's out. Really so... well, was there a guess? Yeah, what's, what's your guess? Anybody want to guess? Just shout out. Ten. Ten. What was that? Ten. Ten? Nine. Nine? Okay. Nine. Okay, let's find out. See, am I on my white stones? Yes, okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and whoever said 10, I wonder if you were thinking of both of those lines. It turns out that ninth stone will actually block both of them. And so the ninth stone, take them. It takes a little while to see this. The rules are simple, but, you know, in play, this becomes obvious because white doesn't get nine turns in a row, right? But that's the idea. Now, over here, these are two different groups. They're actually separable. And they are separable because they aren't really connected directly by a road. If I come over here and start surrounding, say, these two down here, I can actually surround them entirely independently, entirely independently of the other group. And so those are two separate groups in Go. And when you're playing and, and worrying about things getting captured, you have to worry about these cutting points. Okay, well, here's another one. And I actually meant to black out these white, or remove the white stones before we started talking, but here's a black group all firmly connected by roads. How many, and I, I have failed to introduce the word, they're called liberties. This had nine liberties. That's the English word we, we use to describe that. And so this group of black stones has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, but it's not captured yet. To capture the stone, you have to place that last 13th liberty and then they would get removed. Well, now is when it gets interesting. So that was called an I. This is this is an I, an I little blank there. And there is a saying in Go that two eyes make life. Look at this group down here. These black stones are totally surrounded on the outside. But the problem is white can't kill it at all. If white tries to play here, that white stone itself is surrounded. It would be suicide. There's no way for it to get out. And black still has another liberty. So this move is illegal. You're about to play a suicide move. Can't do that. It said play anyway. That's because this is a demonstration tool, not a, not a game playing tool. And so this black group is unkillable. It cannot be killed. And more than that, jump back into edit mode here for a second. I think uh, Any... Madeline has hands up. Okay, she let me finish this sentence and then we'll come to that. Any, anything connected to this black group would be unkillable. Even if white totally surrounded this, there would still be the problem of not being able to poke out both eyes. For those of us of an older generation, 
I sometimes refer to this as the uh, the Three Stooges rule. I'm always trying to poke out his eyes. He holds his hand up in front of his face so he can't. So yeah, Madeline, please. Yes. Um, so there are the uh, there's the eye that's on the center right of the board. There are the two eyes, which are the lower center of the board. The one on the center left, where there are two uh, open spaces. No, center left, that one. Yeah. Are, is that still referred to as an eye? It's not called two eyes, is it? No, it is. It would be an eye space. And okay, I'm, so I'm even go... if it's two points, it's still called an eye? Um, it, there's a little bit more depth that I'm not going to try and go into. You'd have to have a couple more stones here to make it an, a true eye space to get this surrounded. And it has to do with those cutting points. If I didn't have this, black could go could potentially surround it's it's even more complicated but the answer to your question is an eye is you technically an eye is a single space but there's an eye space is a is a concept in the game and the larger the eye space is if the eye space is big enough black might be able to jump into it and live with its own vertical. but and there the yeah i thought the two eye thing was called the tiger eyes i i think you might be thinking of tiger's mouth which is a shape like that tiger's mouth hmm, no i remember this distinctly as the tiger eyes that yeah, it could, might be it might, you said you're in vietnam maybe that's a vietnamese uh aphorism. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but anyway so yeah so an eye is a single space but and it can, there it, it can or gets a little deeper deeper than i'm going to try to go today but if you attend my third lecture You'll get some. You'll get some more experience with this, but you can have an eye space, and that be, makes the game more interesting and more complicated. Is it really an eye? Can black take out that eye? Become questions. You've well, now learned all the. I'm sorry. We have a Peter hands up. Okay, go right ahead. Yeah, hi Steve. This is uh, Peter. Uh, so I, I actually haven't played this for a while, but I actually played you know, Wei Chi or Go for years with my grandfather. Uh, uh -huh. and, and he never explained this to me. I never bothered to learn. But, you know, Wei Chi obviously goes way before the Art of War, right, which is written yes. by Sun Tzu about 500 BC. Uh, this is much older. And But I was wondering if, I mean, what do you think the answer is? Is it just simply the rules of the game that you're showing us about the eye? Or does it have any uh, real-life military or army tactical reasons for example if you see that there's i in there and the reason why can i be captured my logical thinking is that well there's room for the army to retreat and as soon as you retreat the attacking forces must follow and the, and they will actually be breaking their flanks and that's creating a room for the encircled army to escape is this could this be the reason um yeah, what i can say is very much that so this game after it was known they would teach it to their generals as a strategy game um whether you can make analogies like you're saying um I don't know that the analogies necessarily are always that you know literally true but it's not even just military this game um I there are analogies there they're business leaders that use go as a teaching mechanism for for business. There is an element of this game that is urgent versus big. I talked about um, the balance in the game. Sometimes a move is urgent. If I want these black stones to live, maybe I have to make a move now or else white is going to be able to kill them. That's an urgent situation. And if I don't have anything urgent, maybe I make something big. Or if I have something that is bigger than what I would lose in my urgent case, Maybe I do, but so there's there's a balance, and I can absolutely tell you after learning this game, I begin to think of uh, both uh, not not military, but but um, geometric situations in my life where you know I need to get around this problem, I need to surround that before I can surround this. It definitely has analogies. It was definitely taught to generals to instill a sense of strategy and balance and urgency versus big moves, all of that. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I hope I hope what yeah. I said made sense. Yeah. The retreat. Yeah. I know it does. Attack, attack yeah. after your retreat. Yeah. Because if you, all the black pieces are, like I said, side by side together, like a true entrapment, right? Then there is no retreat, and it just fight to the death. Uh, I'll this up in when I show you what a peaceful opening looks like, which is what I'm going to do next. Um, right. So, oh, you still have hands up. Um, I'm almost done with the rules. So let me just finish because you've learned all the rules but one. I'm just going to explain that one, and then we'll then we'll take take more questions. Um, I forgot about these two down here. This is just to demonstrate that these two can be trapped on the first line. There aren't any roads back here for them to escape. So that is actually a capturing move. I have it in edit mode, so it didn't actually do the thing. Well, now I messed it up. And same thing here. The corner actually only has two livery. But there's only one more rule, and it's called the code rule. And it's based on this last little figure here, this shape. Let's say it's White's turn. This black stone is almost surrounded. Its only run is this way. And white can say, ha ha, I will kill you. But then notice that white stone is all by itself. And black can say, ha ha, I will kill you. And then white says, no, 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 no. I will kill you. And the game gets very boring very fast. So there's a rule against this. And basically all the rule says is you can't immediately take it back. Let me go back into game mode here, Black's turn. If Black takes it, White can't go immediately back. You're about to play a move which repeats a previous board position is how it is actually phrased. And so White has to go play somewhere else on the board. Then maybe, and what they will do is make a threat and maybe Black has to respond to that. Well, then white can take it back. But then black has to play somewhere else on the board. And maybe white really feels like they have to respond to that threat. And then black can come back. But see, the rest of the board is changing. So you don't get into just a simple infinite loop. And those are the rules. So I'll go ahead and take a couple more questions. And then we'll return to the uh, past the origin story history of Gail. Uh, we have a Penny and a Joe. Okay. Um, I assume there's like a certain number of stones that you have in the game. And if like um, in the cases where you're showing the black get captured, then those stones are lost for the rest of the game. Black could not replay them. So there are, there are enough stones to completely fill the board. So you're not going to run out of stones. Okay. But what you are saying, all of these cases where stones were taken, those stones are called prisoners. And in Japanese scoring, the prisoners count as negative one. Chinese scoring is a little different. I'll explain that when we get to, you know, go 102. But yes, when they're removed from the board, black could potentially play in, in, in an empty space again. It might not be a good idea, but they could. But you're not going to run out of stones. And stones that are removed from the board are considered prisoners. Thank you. Certainly. And uh, Joe, please. Yeah, it's just a really brief question because you mentioned that it was taught to generals, and I had heard that in the past. Mm -hmm. But you had also mentioned that it was taught to CEOs. Uh, is this like something that's used present day? as like kind of um, a way of moving up or being promoted or something along those lines or almost like a, a formal test? I believe there are corporate cultures that value the game in East Asia. I don't know that any of them use this as a an absolute criteria for promotion. I don't know if anyone on the call may be from that part of the world and know more than I do on that. Or if it's still used by generals or... I, it's played by a lot of people, and I think that there are business people okay. that find value in it. I think there are military people that find value in it as a strategic way of thinking. Yeah, cool. Okay. So let me just show you one more thing. Let me show you what a peaceful opening looks like. So that was all crap, what I was showing there. White was taking several turns in a row. That doesn't that doesn't. Well, here's what a game might look like. There's Black's move. There's White's move. There's Black. 
Bears White. Notice they're starting in the corners. The reason for that is in a corner, I've already got two walls to my back. So if I want to try and surround some territory, I'm, if I start in the corners, I'm going to need fewer stones to get the job done because I already have two borders to my territory. So play typically starts in the corners. And over here, uh, Black says, well, if you want some of that corner, I want some of it too. And White says, okay, that's fine, but I'm going to have some. Black says, fine, I'll take the other side of that corner. And Go is very much a conversation like this. After you've learned to play, you really do understand this next white move is White saying, you know what, you've got one stone there. If I let you place another one there, you're going to get a lot of that corner. I'd better stop that. And Black says, yeah, but I want the corner underneath. And White says, fine, but I'm going to take the outside. And if you don't do something, I'm going to kill that stone. So Black says, okay, I'll protect the stone. White says, I better connect my cutting point. Remember how I said you, the diagonals are cutting points you got to worry about? Slightly more complicated reason why Black wants to do this. It, it, it's strategically bad not to. And White says, fine, I'll take the other side. So it's very much a conversation like this. This is another common pattern you'll see in a corner. And so now back to your uh, military analogies, this was a very peaceful opening. No one has really invaded, and yes, that's the term we use in Go. No one has really invaded someone else's space. Black has kind of staken out this corner, White's got this area pretty well settled. Black's got a lot along the top here, but White's got a lot over here probably. Um, and so this is a peaceful opening. If I go back a little bit, um, you know, Black could make things more complicated. Go there. Now White is starting to feel a little cut off. So maybe they're they're going to reach out. White's going to, Black's going to say, I want the corner. It, this is an invasion. Um, an invasion more typically, go back. I get back on the main branch. There we go. Um, all right, find another spot that would be a good invasion. Yeah, I'm not. I made this this opening so peaceful; it's a little hard to see. Uh, here, here's an example. Maybe instead of going there, uh, after Black goes here, White says, "I'm going to try and take that corner away from you." That's an invasion. This Black Stone was trying to say, "Hey, I want that corner." White says, "Nope, I'm going to jump in there and try and take it from you." That's an invasion. And so there is, and there are invasions. There is outflanking. There is surrounding maneuvers. So it is very sort of battlefield strategic feeling to the game. So any case, this is how an, a, a game might, a very peaceful opening might look. So I, I still mentioned you take the corners first, you tend to work on the edges next, because again, you've got a wall over it. Another thing that's going to come up again and again and again, so I want to emphasize it now, is the third line. Again, we count this This as one. One, two, three. Points along, stones along this third line are sometimes called territory stones. They're, they're getting territory. This is the line of territory. And the reason is, remember to have a living group, you have to have two eyes. If I have... a bunch of white stones here, how is black ever gonna get underneath there and make two eyes? White's gonna be able to stop them. Whereas stones along the fourth line, there's almost some room to get two eyes under here. It's a little complicated to explain why, but so the fourth line is often called the line of influence. I'm influencing this area, and you know what? If white tries to jump in there and live, I'll certainly get so I'll get a nice wall facing outward. So these are influence stones. I'm probably going to get this, but if not, I'm going to get some of this. That comes up uh, again later as I'm describing how the rules evolve. But it has to do with you, you just can I can I get two eyes in that underlying space there? 
for those of you who may be go players yeah this is too tight to really be able to live in but the idea of the third line and fourth line is what i'm trying to do there all right so i am ready to return to the history part if we're ready for that I was remembering a lot of times they're in the making a line of stone side by side, black and white. Is is that kind of inevitable sometimes, or that that can happen? Sure. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a back back to the beginning. So maybe white goes here instead. Black make whoop. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in edit mode. My mistake. Moment. Back into game mode. And black. There. So what you may end up with uh, something like this, where they're sort of forming next to each other. Because white's trying to protect this third line territory space, and black is trying to get, get out and get more outside space. You can, in fact, have two lines occur along the middle. That would be more of a middle game thing. So I'd have to set up set up a game that where that makes sense. But yes, it generally means white is trying to get territory on one side and black is trying to get territory or influence on the other side. But yes, it can happen, definitely. Anything else? All right. I will, I will put in a small commercial at this point. Um, we, we have decided to do the, a third one in this series where I'm going to try and teach you guys to play online. So if you are interested in giving this a try, we haven't set the date for this one yet, but uh, please feel free. Um, I will ask you guys, whoever's going to play that day, to RSVP because we need to set you up with an account on a Go server ahead of time so that we don't spend the whole meeting trying to get people set up. But if you want to play this game, I'm, I'm here to, to give you an opportunity to give it a try. All right, now back to our story. Okay, so that what I talked about so far is the origins, the, the, the dim, deep, historic origins. Well, certainly by ACE, certainly by the Han Dynasty, a couple hundred years later, the game is well established. Well, what happens next? As with a lot of cultural things and philosophy and belief systems, things tend to travel from China through Korea to Japan. And that is the route Go is taken. So Go in Korea. So the earliest story is one that I love. It is about a Baduk. So Baduk is Go in Korea. It's the, it's the name of the game in Korean, Baduk. And uh, there's this lovely story of a monk spy a go-playing spy. This is during the Three Kingdoms period in Korea. And one of the kingdoms, I've got it written down here. Which, again, my Korean pronunciation is almost as bad as my Japanese, or my uh, Chinese. Where are they? Kogoryu, apparently. Kogoryu uh, had this guy in this dorim and he was a go-playing monk uh, with that king, and he sent him over to Pakche kingdom. And he told him, go over, to, go over to this other kingdom, and, you know, just wander in. You're a mendicant priest. You're a wandering priest. You enjoy the game of Go, because I know the king of that other kingdom really enjoys the game. Make friends with him. See what you can get into the court. See if you can get into the court and become a spy. And he does. And in fact, he the, the, the king of the other kingdom takes him on and loves playing Go with him. They get to know each other really well. And Dorim convinces the other king to extravagantly spend on his kingdom, raise the kingdom up, spend on these great works for, for his kingdom, and depleted the kingdom's funds. And so the first kingdom, after that's happened, manages to walk in and pretty well take things without a fight. That's the story. Um, is, did it literally happen? I haven't tried researching the actual history. The, it, the dates don't quite line up because the three kingdoms all kind of end at the same time. Uh, and this and later, it's like 660 something, I think. And this story comes from 475. So maybe it happened on a smaller scale. Maybe it was an elaboration of a lovely another story. But I love the story. A Baduk playing spy? Come on. Gotta love that. 
There are some other references in here. There was a poem reference, Stoneboard. Sunjan Baduk is a spin-off version of the game that I'm going to talk about. It's the same game, um, really identically the same game. The only difference is the board starts in this position. This is the beginning setup, and then it's Black's turn. Notice these are on the fourth line. Their influence. Black might end up here. Black might end up with a wall facing outward. And so this, this brand of, of go immediately leads to fighting with this initial setup because I'm, you're immediately going to want to start jumping underneath or trying to build on the outside. But anyway, that was a unique uh, variant of the game that occurred in Korea. Um, there, so international rules I'm going to talk about here in just a little bit ended up being reintroduced. Uh, so Sun John Badu lasted for a while um, and eventually got replaced by a more international rule set, which I'm going to explain a little bit later, um, around the 19th century when one of the several times that Japan invaded Korea. This has happened. Best. Today, in Korea, it, to, today the game of Go is most popular per capita in South Korea. It's estimated one in 10 to one in four people play the game. Um, I didn't say this in the very beginning, but you know, in this side of the planet, this game is hardly known. In China, Japan, and Korea, it's very well known. There are cable channels devoted to uh, competitive Go watching games. There are game reviews in the newspapers. Very well known. Here, not so many people. So, moving through Korea to Japan. First of all, I love this picture. This is uh, Sato uh, Tanobu. And the story behind this picture is that he was playing Go with a friend and he didn't have his sword handy. He's a samurai and he didn't have his sword handy and someone attacked so he used the go board as a weapon. Uh, I'm going to show you a floor go bomb like this at the end of the presentation. This is a big, hefty piece of wood, but I just love that. I, I have a t-shirt that has this picture on it, but the caption on it says Samurai Rage Quit, which for the younger people in our audience means you're pissed off and you just throw the board. I'm done. But anyway, that's the story. So go made its way into Japan by about the 7th century. Many boards, the game is pretty well established in the world by now. The big interesting thing that happened in Japan in the history is around 1602. Some of you may know there was a, a great unification of Japan. Um, Tokugawa Ieyasu was the sort of end of that, but there were actually two other people before him. There it is. Nobunaga. Nobunaga began to unify Japan in the late 1500s. These guys were all somewhat contemporaries. Um, he, uh, uh, Oda Nobunaga, he was eventually, he was replaced and, and superseded by Totoyomi Hideyoshi, who did a lot more of the unifying. He actually got most of Japan unified. As a matter of fact, he pretty well got all of Japan unified. So, you know, there's a lot of warfare warfare going on. He unifies Japan and he's got this army that, you know, just, you know, wants to fight. So what do you do if you've taken over the whole country and you still have an army that wants to fight? You're in Japan. You invade Korea. So that's what he did. That, that invasion did not go so well. And uh, Korea actually pushed them back. And by the end... Um, Totoyomi Hideyoshi was kind of losing his mind. Um, there's some theory that it was a sexually transmitted disease, actually, that was causing syphilis, I think they said, that was causing him to lose a little bit. And his son was uh, very young, five or six, I think, at his passing. And so uh, Hideyoshi created a, a, a council of five elders to be regents for the country. Uh, until his son became of age. And I believe uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu was one of the five, and he politically managed his way into the lead. 
So that's the quick side history of the unification of Japan. Well, once that happened, one of the things he did is he created ghost schools and created a castle series, a competitive series. This is the first competitive go that I am aware of. There may have been other ones earlier, but this is when it really took took hold as a competitive sport. You, you as ghost schools, it's like Zen schools. You know, they're, they, they have their own version of things. They try and keep their proprietary information, how they play the game. And the winner became the Go Doroki, the Minister of Go. And so in the history of Go, Japan was really the center of Go from about 1600 until the 20th century. Still played elsewhere, but it really took off in Japan. So I will pause there. I think from here I go into the 20th century. So any questions about the migration through Korea and Japan? The CK, please. Uh, not a question. It's more like a comment. Although I think, Steve, you're correct that Korea pushed back uh, uh, Hideyoshi's armies in 1592 and 1596. Right. But they only managed to do that with the massive assistance of uh, Ming China. So the Ming dynasty in China intervened massively with uh, a, a huge army to defeat Hideyoshi's armies. In the uh, 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 in in the uh, in the wars, so that's that's just all what I'm trying to like uh, say. Oh yeah, thank thank you for that elaboration, and I'll try and remember that detail for the next time I do the talk. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Peter, please. Oh yeah, and for me, it's the uh, the other gentleman talked about you know the later one and the seventh century. It's I mean, if, for anyone who's good with Chinese history, uh, it's that's about the beginning bit or first half, you could say, of the Tang Dynasty, uh, which is one of the golden ages of China. So that actually created a lot of influence around the world, all the way to the Byzantium, actually, empire. Uh, you know, let alone it was, of course, Japan and South Korea. So that's, I believe it was during that dynasty, Japan sent like 21 different envoys the, you could say the brightest students from their top university that kind of, you know, think of it that way to China, take back. It's, you know, what they learned, the culture. And, you know, I, I would say that's probably, you know, how Go got into Japan. And I'd like to say right. something a little about Japanese invasions. A lot of people don't know the derivation of the word kamikaze besides World War II attacks on aircraft carriers. But apparently, uh, Japan was being invaded by a fleet, and kamikaze means the divine wind that blew the fleet away from Japan. So it's a very famous word. Yes, it is. I don't know when that happened, but I was aware of that story. Uh, CK, please. <clears throat> well, Japan was being invaded by uh, Yuan Dynasty, China's Yuan Dynasty, by Kublai Khan. Uh, twice, so there were two fleets sent uh, towards Japan, and the f the first was eliminated on an island between Japan and Korea because of uh, the divine wind, which the Japanese called kamikaze. The second one was similar; it was also blown away to uh, into smithereens by the divine wind. So there were two invasions yeah. from Korea launched by uh, uh, Mongol China, uh, the Mongol dynasty, the Yuan dynasty in China. Uh, and, and it was in 12, I believe 12, uh, the 1280s, twice, uh, both events happened in the 1280s. Excellent, thank you very much. I appreciate there is far more history in that part of the world than I am personally aware of. I appreciate the fleshing out of the, the broader world picture. Uh, Mandarin, please. Yes, thanks. Well, I have an entirely unerudite question. Uh, it's about the layout of the board. I believe it was the Korean one with the initial starting positions all along the lines of influence. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that um, 
moving inward and outward. And I was just wondering about the way it's conceptualized. Is it conceptualized as inward is along the edges because those are the walls and outward you're moving away from your own walls towards the center? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, usually down is towards the edges and up is away from the edges. You can kind of think if this was a tall pyramid in the middle, you're climbing up away from the edge. So in, in the lingo, you usually talk about down here is under and up here is over. That was a good question. So, uh, Steve, I have a question to ask you. Do, do, do you uh, play in the club in American? Do I play what? Play a go, a go game with the uh, public club or something they call club. Yeah, yes, yeah. Since I'm in Cincinnati, and so okay. Cincinnati Go Club is the club, and There's your city of, may uh, very well have a Go Club as well. There's a lot of Korean play there. Um, our club is mostly American and Chinese. Um, okay. Yeah, we did. There was one. Uh, he was half Korean gentleman. He ended up moving to California after a bit. Um, but our our particular group is mostly uh, American and, and Chinese. Okay, so because uh, my uncle also a fan of uh, play game, he lives in the Southern California, and uh, he joined the club to play, but he said, except him, everybody is Korean, so. <laughs> yeah, it depends on where you are and, wh and what club, you know, gravitates. Okay, so if we're ready to move on. Okay, so Go has been, the, Japan has been the center of Go for a couple hundred years. Now we're going to talk about how it kind of made its way to the rest of the world. Was there a question? Okay, I thought I heard something. All right, so Go in the 20th century. I, I This is my uh, characterization. I refer to it as the age of national Go associations. This is when it really became um, international. Um, the travel to the West, in, in the U.S., you, you really might think that the game made it to the U.S. through Chinese immigrants in the, in the West in the 1800s. Um, but that does not seem to have really happened. It didn't really take off into, into white culture at that time. I'm sure the immigrants were playing Go. Must have been. The way it really broke into Europe and the West was actually an accidental discovery one day in a cafe. There were some German mathematicians and there was a, a newspaper or a magazine article about the game. Um, I presume in translation, I don't think they, they spoke Japanese or Chinese, I think it was in translation, but they got interested in it. And it is, as you might imagine, because of the geometry and the fact that you're surrounding and you're counting those liberties, there, there's a lot of mathematical uh, thinking behind it. So they got interested in the game and wrote a paper on it. And that is actually what really became the catalyst in the early 20th century for it to spread to the rest of the world, West, the Western world. Um. And through the 20th century, different countries began creating their own national Go associations, which I have listed here. Interestingly, China was one of the last to do it. I, I'm not sure why that is, but that's that's the order of things in, in terms of a formal Go association. And it became internationally competitive. Like I said, this this is a this is a mental sport. Um, playing playing a full board game. You can make timing rules, like you can do like a chess clock, you can do a clock, but full games can take two hours, three hours, longer, potentially. Yeah. It's a mental endurance sport, and there are cups, comp cup competitions with prizes in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that happen currently. I want to bring attention to this gentleman over here. Um, he was born Chinese, and I... I will invite Jason to properly pronounce his name here, if that romanization makes oh, sense. Oh, yeah, uh, Wu Qing. I, I believe it's Wu Qing Yuan. You know, so. Okay. And he, um, again, Go was really kind of the, 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 the pinnacle of Go at that time was in Japan. He went to Japan to study. 
and became known there is Go Sagan. And uh, he is considered by many to be the, the GOAT, the greatest of all time uh, Go player. My One of my mentors, um, Evan Corday, who sadly passed away a little less than a year ago, this was his hero, man. Um, but he was not the only one. Um, Go Sagan is considered to be one of the best, if not the best ever Go players. I'll, I'll try to remember to bring it up when I talk about the AI stuff. But some of the stuff that AI has discovered was stuff that Go Sagan had tried. So, interesting. Okay, so evolution of play. So, like I said, the basic rules have remained the same for literally thousands of years. The board size actually started early on as a 17 by 17 grid and eventually grew to a 19 by 19, and that became standard around the 8th, 8th century. And it's really kind of interesting why. And it's not a historical why, it's a logical why. So I mentioned before about this third line tends to be territory, that it's hard to get under that line and, and make two eyes, and that the fourth line is often considered influence. You know, you're, you're facing outward because you the other team, the other player might be able to get underneath there. Very interestingly, if you take a third line rectangle and you say those take all of that area as territory. That is 136 spaces of territory done with 56 stones. The efficiency of that area per stone is 2.42. If you consider the fourth line and consider it surrounding the interior, and take that efficiency, that's 121 spaces of territory that took 48 stones to accomplish. And the efficiency is very nearly equal. That's the mathematical expression of it. The playing expression of it is, whoops, wrong one, one moment. In a peaceful game like this, Um, when, if somebody gets underneath, you can usually equally profit by going out. If someone is making territory out here, you can usually equally profit by, by going underneath. Now, I don't think anybody sat down and did the math to figure this out. I think they played on the 17 by 17 board. And if you think about it, smaller board, let me go back to this picture, a smaller board uh, that. Um, a smaller board, this outside area is going to be bigger. You know, the center is smaller because it's still going to be third and fourth line. That doesn't scale. It's third line because you don't have enough space underneath it. It's fourth line because you almost have enough space underneath it. So I think when they're playing on the 17 by 17, they began to get a feel that, you know, you really needed to grab the sides because you weren't going to be able to do much in the middle. But if you make a larger board, whether you do it in the sides or in the middle, it's about equal. There's some people who have talked about trying to make a 25 by 25 grid. What kind of game would that lead to? Well, it would make the center much more important because there's more of it to surround. So this 19 by 19 is, is that to me, again, I'm a man, I mentioned I was a teacher. I was a math teacher. That, this is really fascinating to me, that the balance between territory and influence happens on a 19 by 19 because of this efficiency. Anyway, I find that interesting. I hope you did too. Another variation that happened is the starting positions. Um, I mentioned Sunjan Baruch, and I showed you that setup. Early China would start with two black stones and two white stones. It'd be, you know, a black stone in these two corners and a white stone on these two corners, on those star points that somebody pointed out in the very beginning, those little darkened black points on the four by four, four point. So China would start with two black and two white stones. Japan pioneered starting the board empty. 
And that is internationally what's what's come on. Again, Japan, it was kind of a spread from Japan in the 1800s to the rest of the world. Um, and I like that. I, there's something very zen about starting with an empty board. You see, I have a t-shirt that has a picture of a go board and the caption, in the beginning, there was nothing. You get to decide how to build things up. It's actually kind of interesting because the Chinese were playing with the four stones, the two black and two white, the, the, the Chinese tended to be, they, they would, in their games, because they're starting with stones on the board, they tend to get into fights a little earlier. And it's actually a cross game, which tends to make fights happen a little earlier. And stone, black stones in opposite corners, white stones in opposite corners. So the Chinese players were maybe a little better at the fighting, the inner, you know, knife fight play. Japan plays with an empty board. So they got a little stronger at sort of beginning to develop influence and then get into a fight. And so in the game of Go, there is something called the Chinese opening. If you hear about chess openings, sometimes get names. There is a Chinese open. And I'm not going to take the time to try and show it, so I'll run out of time here. But um, it essentially, the Chinese opening sort of opens a door just wide enough that you really want to invade there. And so that was the strategy that they developed against playing against Japan on an open board. They would try and start this opening that created a Chinese opening and really tempt them to come in and invade. And then they'd get into a fight and they'd be in a you know, better position. Again, I find that interesting. So the starting positions vary a little bit. These days, people play with an empty board, including Korea. The, the Sunjang Badu got overtaken. Um, there are Fuseki and Joseki. Jo uh, these are Japanese terms. Again, most of the lingo in my club and in much of the U.S. has come through Japan. Joseki are common corner patterns. And they're common because they're about equal. If you look at this little picture, whites kind of got this area, Black's kind of got a, maybe a little less area here, but has more influence out to the middle of the board. These Joseki have evolved over time. A new player tries a new idea, that whole inductive reasoning thing I talked about before. Hey, I got in this position last time I played here and it didn't work, let me try this. These Joseki have evolved and they become sort of standards because they are equal. There's this balance aspect to the game of Go again. Fuseki is sort of the same thing with opening positions. It's sort of openings that have become common because they are balanced. So that's another evolution of the play. Um, I'm gonna bring this up again when we talk about AI because it's a pretty fascinating thing that AI did with these common patterns. Another concept is Komi. This is this is one of the few, you know, like real kind of rule changes, sort of rule change. If you think about it, Black plays first. They've got a little bit of an advantage because they've placed the first stone on the board. They've already begun to surround some territory in some sense. And traditionally, i.e. before the 20th century, the way that was handled was... Um, the more experienced player plays white, the less experienced player plays black. So the less experienced player has that little bit of advantage. And so they play and they play and they play. And maybe the player who's playing black eventually gets good enough and starts beating white. So then they swap. And the person who was playing white now plays black and gets that little bit of an advantage. So the advantage was known about before the 20th century. It was just handled differently. In the 20th century, they tried to assign Comey, which is giving a number of points to white to compensate for Black's advantage. And they started with four and a half points. And just through the experience of play, that didn't feel like quite enough. And they eventually worked their way up to seven and a half points. And again, there's another wonderful thing that I'll talk about when we come to AI. Uh, I'll go ahead and just blurt this one out. AI came out with this number. So, you know, it, it was able to figure out the same balance that humans did in the 20th century. 
There's some scoring variations. Um, I mentioned a while ago, someone asked about the prisoners being taken, the pieces taken off the board. Japan scores those, it's negative, and they count the spaces inside your territory. So they would count down here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They would count the territory that way. Chinese scoring, they don't pay attention to prisoners at all, actually, and they count the territory and the stones. Turns out these are mathematically identical. I'm not going to try and explain why now, but I'll explain to somebody later if they're really interested. But they're 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 mathematically equivalent. They come out with and a half a point of each other. But I have a wonderful story about this because in my club I got used to scoring Japanese. I knew there was a Chinese method. I kind of understood it, but you know, I hadn't really learned it yet. And I was playing in a small tournament um, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and that tournament was run by Chinese club. And I was playing somebody, and they got ready to score the game, and the guy came over to score our game. And the first thing he did was take all my prisoners and dump them in the bowl. I'm like, wait, those are my prisoners. I need those. The next thing he did was uh, remove, essentially remove all of one color from the board. What are you doing? This is how Chinese scoring works. If you think about it, you only really need to know who got more area, right? So if I count just the white stones... I know Blackstone had the rest of the board, so it works out. But it was very disconcerting for me. Now I know how it works. <laughs> anyway, so there are some scoring variations. Korea has another subtle variation. American Go Association, I mentioned that the two Chinese and Japanese can be off by like half a point. In the U.S. Go Association, they have a version at the end you, of the game you pass, and they've instituted a process whereby you literally pass a stone and if you do it that way, then the two scoring systems are identical. So a little bit of math in there, but I won't bother trying to explain. There are modern creative invariants. People who've played on, go on a torus. Uh, if you take the board and you wrap it around like a cylinder and then wrap it around like a donut, it's essentially playing go on a board with no edges. People have done three-dimensional go. There's creative variants. Those are not terribly common, but they are terribly interesting. Okay, so now we come to the artificial intelligence. Uh, so before you move on, you yes. want to take questions from Medina? Yeah, please. Yeah, good good idea. Let's, let's pause. I basically have the AI, and then I'm going to show you some of the equipment. That's what I have left to go, and I think I've still got adequate time. Yeah, I should be okay on time. But yes, yeah. take some questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's just a, a quick question on the two scoring systems, Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It seems that the uh, the uh, dumping the pieces in the bowl, not the prisoners, but the pieces on the board, let's say that Black had taken a lot of positions in the center and White had taken them at the edges, but the edge bits wouldn't count, right? The ones that were on that line on those outer lines. Do, do you mean like outer lines like yes. where I have my cursor? No, those yep. count, those are points. Those would count as territory points. Okay, thanks. Did that answer it? Okay, yeah, yeah, those actually do, they, those would be counted. So Any other uh, questions? Uh, Peter, please. Yeah, I, uh, uh, this this question uh, for Steve, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not for the rules because I kind of know the variations already, but I was wondering if you, you know, if you know this at all, right? It, it's do you think there is um correlation between the Eastern, you should I could say collectivism versus the Western more individualized individual culture that derived two different you know chess uh, or like you know board games, right? For example, chess is when you look at chess, there's like there's a social hierarchy in the army. Right, the king is the most important piece, right? And this whole checkmate thing, and, and the queen is the most powerful by maneuvers and trickles down. And when you look at Go, it's very much uh, e each piece, black or white, it's it's equal. There is no hierarchy. I was wondering if you have any explanations for that. It's very interesting that you ask because I get asked that about every time I do this presentation. Um, I don't think there's a definitive answer, but yeah. I do think there is a different mindset. Um, as you point out, chess is hierarchical. It is battling, and I want to kill and capture. 
capturing happens in Go, but it's not really the goal. Go, you know, as you, as you point out, the, point, the pieces are all equivalent. The places are all equivalent. You're both, it's a very even feeling game. Um, it's, it's about building territory. It's not about capturing something. I, I, my own opinion is I do feel like there's kind of a different mindset um, that, that is, you know, kind of behind those. Now, chess, of course, originated in India, which is not all that far from China, but it certainly became popular in the West. So, yeah, I don't have a definitive answer, but it does have a different feel. People ask the game, and you inevitably have to compare it to chess because it is another deep thought, strategic kind of game. But it has a very different feel. Um, right, right. There's, yeah, as I, I mentioned, there's balance, there's push and give, there's I can't take too much, I can't, don't want to overreach. It's not trapping. It's not, it's not the same. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I just, you know, I'm saying that when you when you look and go, it has less emphasis on the individual, right? So, yeah, I I I experience that same sentiment when I play, and in the pieces, your your analogy, I I, I agree with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ro you wanna... uh, Rosel, Roseli, Rosel, please. Uh, yeah, um. I just sometimes the with the territories and the black and white sometimes it reminds me of backgammon. I just wanted to know if there's uh similarities and differences. Sure. Yeah, there's um a, <laughs> one quote that I like is so you know backgammon can be played with a dot, right? So there's luck involved. So yeah. one one quote I that I sort of enjoy is backgammon if you'll excuse the gendered program pr pronouns, backgammon is man against luck. Chess is man against man. Go is man against himself. I love that. Um, as far as historical connections, backgammon is a separate game. They, they have black and white pieces, but they're pretty different. I, I'm guessing you've played backgammon before? I've played both. You play both, okay? Yeah. So backgammon, it's 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 just it's a different game, right? You're you're trying to race around a course, and you're it's it's just it's not the same. Historically, they're they're not particularly connected. The one that Go gets compared to a lot, we always get asked if we're playing Othello, which is closer. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh Othello! I think that was because I get backgammon and Othello confused a lot. I played all three oh. of them. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Othello is the one where if you go around the end, you flip all of them from you flip them from one color to the other. Oh yeah, okay, so that's probably what I was talking about. That's the one you were thinking about. Yeah, when we're playing in in cafes, we get asked that all the time. Oh, is that Othello? We're like, no, um, <laughs> it's a weird third cousin, maybe. I think Othello is actually a pretty recently invented game. Um, but yeah, you know, there's similarities in that there's the black and white in the grid, and there's a certain aspect of surrounding in Othello as well. Interesting question, though. Yeah, uh, next go to uh, CK, please. Yes, I'm, I was pondering on Peter's earlier question about uh, Wei Qi or Go versus uh, international chess. I'm wondering whether that is a suitable comparison when you go into uh, group psychology, because in, in, in China, there is also another game called Xiang Qi, which, uh, which has hierarchies, and I'm sure Jason knows the, the game, and it is also quite individualistic compared to uh, Go or Wei Qi. So if you compare Xiang Qi with uh, international chess, they are different, but not as different. So Correct. Japan, whether, Japan, Japan is um, shogi, which is also a similar, ch more chess-like game. Yeah, so I'm just wondering whether whether we're comparing like with like here. It's maybe not an appropriate comparison. Well, I wasn't making the comparison. I was just wondering why the difference in in or there could be a correlation between cultural mindsets. It is a very fair point, though that. Both China and Japan have very chess-like games as well. 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure. You know, the Xiangqi, the the is. I kind of suspect it's learned from Western chess. I I I guess, but all through the Arabian, you know. That that's my guess. Of course, there's no historical evidence. You know, my know my understanding history. was that it it. it it came. It was finally developed in its current form by the Northern Song Dynasty, by the additions of artillery, the artillery pieces, the pao. But mm -hmm. prior, before that, the xiangqi, the basic formation and the basic pieces, uh, were in existence. The artillery pieces uh, was uh, the 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 uh, the so-called uh, additions in the tenth and eleventh centuries. Okay, we we'll probably want to put the Xiangqi uh, on hold yeah, until someone you know have a better. <laughs> That's an interesting. I don't know anything about the yeah, history we'll... of that or Shogi actually. The yeah, Shogi or Xiangqi, we can uh, have another section. You know, somebody are interested or. Uh... I would. I would attend that. Yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> I would like to know. Yeah, actually, uh, actually, I all things should be more. It can be more international and through you know even I call it Asian <laughs> philosophies. You know, because another thing is associated with uh, this world. So let's move on for uh, Mark and the Dave. Then I have another question. So thank you. Yeah, um, thanks, Peter. I was actually going to address this question because I've studied it, but it's been quite a while, probably like 20 years. But it's my understanding that Shang-Chi, Shogi, and there's a Korean version too, which is very similar to the Chinese version of Shang-Chi, all have the same origin as what is now international chess, but originally was just European chess, and they all come from India. Um, they all have a lot of similarities. They all have like a, a square board. They all have kings, horses, and castles. Um, the Asian versions have elephants and cannons, which you don't have in the West. I suspect because you don't have elephants in the West and because gunpowder was invented in the East, so that happened earlier. Um, and then another significant difference is that the Asian versions don't have queens, um, but the, uh, uh, the European version does. And then the last difference is that the Asian versions have a fortress that the king is in, whereas the European version does not. But they're all essentially the same name. And um, if, you, if you play them, you know, they're, they're very, very similar in many, many ways. So that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, Shogi also has rules whereby pieces can come back on the board, which is different than, mm -hmm. well, I guess, clean. Anyway, that's uh, the other topic, I guess. Yeah, that's another topic. Okay, Dave, <laughs> Dave please. Yeah, to me, the pieces in Go seem to be like peasants that kind of sit in the land and don't move. Yeah, okay. <laughs> they don't move. That is true. I didn't emphasize that in the beginning. When I teach go to a new person, that's usually the first sentences out of my mouth are you place the board on the stone and they don't move. Because, you know, most main games you do. Yeah, that's a perfect. Uh, that, then I have that, my question is about prisoner. Okay, so I, I really like your mathematical background. You talk about the war and the, the ratio. I think that's only... <laughs> A mass teacher can think about this. <laughs> Another thing, I, I'm very interested. You talk about Japanese rule and the Chinese rule. Uh, you put the prince prisoner back, right? And then you say the result are the same, right? Yes. Okay, I do feel this way. I kind of because I learned in the Japanese way, and the end, right? Uh, that we will put it back, and then. Unless you're a child again, right? You keep trying to eat him as small as pass as, as as many uh as strong as possible, then you got negative. Okay. So that's the difference here. For professional, I kind of feel like there's no purpose, but I didn't figure it out. I think it's supposed to be double damage, but I do have a feeling it's a uh, it's no difference. But I'm glad that you say that. But I believe you have yeah. a medical it proof on that. One, there's a more math more mathematical way to say it, but it, it, the, when a prisoner is taken, um, that point was in your, um, how do I say this? We, we, if you move inside your territory to take a piece, you failed to move somewhere else where you could have advanced further. 
and those two things kind of balance each other out. And since in Chinese you count the stone that might have reached further, they end up being mathematically equivalent to so within a half point, unless you do the American Go Association passing of a stone, then they're equal. Well, Steve, another way to look at this is Go is much more. I'm not saying it's exclusively one way or the other. I'm just saying that it's more Go is much more leaning towards uh much more leaning towards resource strategy uh resource distribution yeah. right and and and, yeah. and ch chess is much more of strategy with what, what you have and assuming you you know with the assumption there's nothing more coming yeah that's a good point there, you, you in playing go you often refer to the efficiency of a move um that's if i look at this picture this joseki pattern down here that's so common reaching out that far is good efficiency. If I place this stone in closer, I'm, I'm, I've got too many stones close together. It's inefficient, is is how you would refer to that. So it is, it is. There is an aspect of efficient efficiency, resource management kind of aspect of the game. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Mark have hands up, but Steve, do uh, we have a uh, twenty minutes left? Uh, how's time doing? It's okay. Um, let's take one more, and then let me finish, and then we'll we'll talk with whatever time is left. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Mark, is it? Yeah, that, that last comment made me think of something which is really similar to the previous comment about um, the hierarchy in chess versus the the uniformity in Go. Um, because all the versions of chess, the Chinese, Korean, and Japanese versions, all have that hierarchy. Um, kind of similar to the European chess, or what's now called international chess. But another really interesting difference is that in those uh, four games, shogi, Korean, Chinese, and European chess, the goal is all about the king. Nothing else matters but killing the king. Your entire army can be wiped out, but if you get the opponent's king, that's the way the game is won. Whereas, and then this, this is where this resource comment comes in. Like, whereas Go is about the overall territory and the kind of economics of the situation. So not only is the chess, all four versions of it, have the hierarchical aspect in terms of the pieces are different. It also has a hierarchical aspect in terms of the ultimate goal. The goal is just to yeah. get the king. And nothing yep. else matters. That's, that's all. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, clearly, Jason, we need to find an expert on the variants of the, the international variants of chess. Because I would I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, the position is open. So and you know, anyway. <laughs> okay, so let me finish up here. So I have one more slide, then I'm, I'm going to talk about just the materials. Uh, the the playing field. There's some interesting things in there. I think I think you'll find interesting. So artificial intelligence. So the talk I'm going to go in two weeks is going to go into a lot of detail about this, but um, just summarized on one slide. So many of us are familiar with the Kasparov, IBM Deep Thought uh, story of chess, where the deep, deep or deep blue or deep, deep deep blue deep thought is it? History Hitchhikers of the Galaxy thing. Um, the Kasparov, where the computer beat the best professional humans for a long for the first time. In Go, that didn't happen until 2016. Um, Go is, though the rules are simpler, the size of the board and the number of branching possibilities made it impossible for deep blue style computing um, approaches to work. Um, they're, they're algorithmic. Um, what it took for a AI to beat the game of Go was uh, neural networks, machine learning. Um, and while I'll get I'll get into this in the other presentation, but machine learning was invented a, a, a longer time ago. The computing power got to a point and was applied to the game. And the story happened in 2016. Lee Sedol here is the first. Um, let's see, he is the first nine don professional. Uh, remember the rankings from the very beginning of the presentation, nine Don of the strong professional or the not strongest players in the world. He was the first to be beaten by Go. It was a five game series, um, best of five. And uh, AlphaGo is the name of the program, one four out of five. The one Lisa Dahl won was fascinating though. 
because they, they, there's a concept in the game of Go, as you might expect with a with an Eastern oriented game of the divine move, so the move that is just so beautiful. It's heavenly. It's subtle. It's amazing. The game that Lee Sedol won, he essentially found a divine move that confused the heck out of the computer. It, I stayed up all night to watch these games. It was, you know, on the other side of the planet. And it was really fascinating to watch because he, he you know, he made this move. And the computer just really started making weird moves. It did not know what to do. And the commentators are talking about, what is it? What is the game? What's the program thinking? It was a really fascinating but nonetheless, unfortunately, he won uh, only one of the five games. The, the original AlphaGo's were trained on human games. If you know anything about machine learning, you use some kind of training data. Um, and they took professional games and, and fed it to the computer to learn from. And the one that beat uh, Lisa Dahl was human trained. Later, they trained the program with no human input. They just taught it the rules, gave it a board, and let it play. And so the first few games it tried to play were utterly random. There was no play in the corner first because you've got the two walls behind you and that's going to be a good idea. It was random chaos. But as the machine learned, it got better. It became more organized. Um, and one of the things I find very interesting, those Joseki patterns, the ones that have become popular because they're even, those Josekis have evolved over time. Humans have evolved them over time. You know, this variation was the popular one. And then somebody found a move that does a little bit better, so it shifted a little bit. The AI that was trained with no human input went through the same Joseki development that the human games went through. I find that fascinating. It evolved strategy just like humans have. And when the AI came out, professional players were very skeptical. Even after it won the game, there was a lot of, it was interesting to hear the commentators because they really didn't want to talk about what the AI was thinking because it's not, it's a computer. It's not a human. Who knows what its strategy is. It's just, it's just some obscure mathematical something that chose that spot. People were very hesitant, but uh, it's proven itself now. And now AI are is an accepted Sensei, Sifu, uh, teacher, um, and is used to by professionals. But professionals began, so AI went beyond human play and learned Joseki that humans hadn't really come up with. Well, that, guess what? Now the humans are trying that because the AI proved, you know what? That was actually a pretty good move. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through the end. This is the end of the technical. Now I just want to show you a little bit about the equipment. Um, when I do this in person, I have a table set up. I have managed to amass a small collection of Go boards, um, part on my own and part I mentioned my Go sensei who passed away last year left some of his materials to me. So I'm going to show you some on camera here in a minute, but I'll talk about it first. So we're out of the history now. We're just going to talk about the stuff, the Go stones. You can buy melanin, which is a, a plastic, kind of hard plastic, glass stones, very affordable. Your entry-level boards will be those. Yunzi are, uh, I refer to them as the champagne of goat in the sense that champagne is liquor that's made only in the champagne region of France. Yunzi stones are technically really only the stones made in Yunnan province in this one factory. Um, they was invent the Yunzi process was invented back in the Tang Dynasty, and they make black and white stones. Um, the the black stones, if you shine a light through them, they kind of have a little bit of a green halo to them. But if, without the light going through it, they just look black. That's how you. This is one way you can tell what a Yunzi if it's a Yunzi stone. Interesting story there. Um, as maybe someone on the phone can can fill the fill us in on on what war this was, but I, as the only part that I know is that there was a, a war in the region where this, this, this uh, civil war, local war in the region where this factory was, and the secrets were lost. They didn't know how to make Yunzi anymore. And that lasted for about 50 years or so. 
And in the 1960s, a Chinese general um, of his name, but he decided to put in the effort to try and reverse engineer the stones. And they eventually, they did. Um, the, the new stones are a little different than the old ones. Um, I am fortunate enough, I believe, I, I couldn't guarantee it because I haven't done the chemical testing, but I believe I have a set of old Yunzi before the before they, the secret was lost. The newer ones, the white stones are whiter. They actually consider them better because they're whiter. The older Yunzi stones have a little bit of a yellow or green kind of tint, something in the process. That's a little interesting side story. They, they lost how to do it, but then re reverse engineered it. Chinese stones tend to be flat on one side, and Japanese stones tend to be biconvex. Korean tends to be biconvex. Bicon um, the Chinese stone has the has an advantage when you're trying to like experiment and play variations when you're discussing the game because you can flip them over to show that this is a this is not one of the moves of the game. This is just something I want to try. It's kind of a nice teaching element. I kind of like the aesthetic of the slightly wobbly biconvex stones myself. In Japan, the quality stones tend to be slate and shell. Um, the, the, they used to be fished out of Japanese beaches, but they've been fished out because there have been a lot of goat players over time. And now mostly they're from Mexican clams. Um, the white stones have uh, thin lines in them, which I'll show you here in a minute. And the grades, the higher grades have more lines. And really that's because if you think of how a clam is made, the hinge is kind of thick. And then as it goes out to where the clam opens, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And the growth rings get closer and closer and closer together. So these stones with lines close together are coming from that thinner edge, less material, more rare, therefore higher quality. And then the black stones are made from slate from, uh, I think that's a region, Nachiguro, Japan. And you can buy stones that are exotic, gem and jade. I don't have any, but I'll show you some of that. This this is just showing. Uh, there's a grinding process for the, This is a slate and shell. This is the traditional way of doing it. Nowadays they have humble humble uh, bins and grinders that that shape them. But this is the traditional way to make them. And they come in different thicknesses. One one aesthetic of the game is if you have a thicker board. It should have thicker stones, just that's aesthetically more pleasing, more balanced. So that's the stones. And the boards, I think this is my last slide. Yes, this is my last slide. Um, they're make, they can be made of many woods. Sort of the most traditional, you know, quintessential go board are made from Huga Kaya. Kai is a type of wood. It's similar to a spruce. Huga is a region in Japan. Those Japan forests, they're now protected. They're not allowed to harvest them anymore. And so it is actually getting harder and harder to get a true Hong, Hong Huga Kaya board. But you can make them of Shin Kaya, which means new Kaya. Um, they tend to be spruce or other light, which you want is a light, even grained board. But they can be made out of bamboo. I have my floor goban I'm going to show you is made of agathus. They can be made of stone, whatever. Cheap boards are made of plastic. You can have a floorboard, which I'm going to show you in a minute. If I were, if we were in the room, I'd be gesturing at these. I have to tell you about them, and then I'll show you. So they're floor and tabletop. So floor is a little uh, board on, on little legs, and you sit down on the floor, sort of, you know, Asian style. And play. Tabletop is what it sounds like. The quality of the board is, is there's how the grain is cut. This this is considered the best cut because it's nice and even on the top. And it's the, the lines are nice and even on the top and nice and even on the bottom. But there are many ways you can you can cut the stones. There's slight variations in standard sizes. I believe the Chinese boards are slightly smaller. So if you're going to go buy a board, make sure you're getting stones that are the same size as your board. Um, and interestingly, the grid is not square. Anybody have any guesses as to why that is? I, I think it's a square. How come it's not square? They're not square. 
They're well, not exactly is, square. Mine because is, because when you play the game, you're not staring directly down at the board. You're sitting away from the board, looking at it at an angle, right? So mm -hmm. they are just not square enough so that when you're looking down the length of the board from your perspective, they look square. That's thinking, huh? I was guessing you might have narrow uh, in between the players, but from what you're saying, due to perspective, you do it the other way. Yeah, they're slightly longer in the direction between the two players. Yeah. And then this is another, this bottom left picture is another traditional way of drawing the lines. Of course, they have modern methods, but this is uh, Tachimori is taking a sword, you dip it in lacquer, and you very carefully sort of roll the sword along the length of the board to draw the lines. So I will try and show you just a little bit of this is my last. Oh, wrong keyboard. There we go. So to do that, I need to go back to Zoom. Stop sharing. Let's see, I need to turn on my camera. So hello again. <laughs> so I have a couple boards here. Um, I'm going to just have to move my laptop oh. around. I don't have a little camera that I can do. So I will just show you a little bit. So you remember the uh, Japanese samurai who had to defend himself. He used one of those. This is a floor gobon. You can see the size of my hand next to it. Um, these are huge, heavy chunks of wood. I think you can see the legs under there. That is the traditional shape of the legs. Um, they have a little hole in the bottom, which is supposed to make the click sound a little bit more powerful. This, that's an aesthetic of the game. If you're about to make a move, and that move is a killer move, man, this is the impressive move, then you go. Make that click when you play the move. But that is, that, that's, a, that's a floorboard. And then I'm trying to see what I'm trying to look at the camera while I do this. This, gosh, hard for me to do this. That is just a tabletop board. Let me get to where we can see the edge of it. Okay. Yeah, so that one is about two soon or about two and a half inches thick. They could be a single piece of wood. That board is a composite. It's actually made of several boards, which kind of keeps the thinner boards from warping. Um, that one is Tachimori. This, that, this one is my prize board. This is the one I spent a fair amount of money on. Uh, not from Japan, so it was drawn with a sword, etc. You can make them with bamboo. You can see the bamboo pattern on there. That's a bamboo board. And then I did say I was going to show you the um, stones. Now the camera can actually see this, I think. Get my right up there. You can see the, the lines on the white stones. The opposite side is usually does not have lines, just again, it's the nature of how the clowns is put together. So the closer the lines are, the closer the lines are, supposedly the higher quality the stone is. These are middle grade stone, they're called blossom grade. These are the black stones. This, this is the one that's uh, Yunzi. This one is Yunzi. If I had a light behind it, you'd see a little green glow. But anyway, it's a little more fun when you can be in the room and walk around and, and look at them. I am actually uh, very honestly interested to, to know whether you felt like that last little show and tell was worth it. Um, I think it is more fun in person, but I thought I'd like to share a little bit of it. So that's all I have. And, and Steve, would you say that there's always a, I mean, sounds obvious, but I still want to ask you this, but there's always going to be a demand for a physical board and, and, and pieces right like for example the reason i'm asking some people have thought about this you know for a while why can't we just all go digital first of all there's the internet connection problem the electricity going out but secondly in a major competition i mean i'm not saying you can't reduce the reduce the possibility but it's it's much harder to to catch cheating in, in a major competition as if you were in 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 person yeah, that's that's true. Uh, there will always be go boards for the same reason. There will always be, always be print books. I like to have the thing in my hand. 
Um, professional competitions, you're right. They tend to be in person during the pandemic. They did go online and they did have some concerns about cheating and that's particularly after the AI, because that was after the AIs had come out. You have the have the AI and the other computer telling you the best move. That's a problem. Uh, so yeah, I, I think there will always be. I I so you can play online. There are online Go servers. Um, OGS is the one that uh, a lot of Americans use, but there's there are Chinese servers galore. Um, and you can always find player that way, which in this half of the planet is sometimes a little harder to do. Um, but I don't like playing online. I like the physical feeling of the stones and being there with someone and playing. There's there's also an, an element of human interaction in it, right? So you, you have folks sitting or you know around a, a board game and kind of they're playing the game, but they're also you know uh, communicating to with each other, spending time together, maybe you know having a cup of tea. Um, there, there used to, there used to be like a you know a whole tradition like that in the in the old Soviet Union, and I'm sure in in China where you have people sitting in parks playing chess or some kind of board games, dominoes. In, you know, in Japan and Korea, play. I'm sorry. In, oh. I'm sorry. In Japan and Korea, there are go salons where you can go and, and, and pay to rent a board, you know? Right, right. When, when you mentioned um, making a sound when you uh, place a piece on, on the board, I, I thought of domino. And I know it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot <laughs> yeah. more basic type of game uh, it's not that intellectual but uh it's just, i just remember when i was young in uh the the people who are like more they're they're more senior citizens <laughs> they, they love just to kind of slam that it's, that piece it's a on style the, yeah style thing you, you style wise you always play the first move of go in the far right quadrant of your opponent black plays in the in the lap of of the better player, the player who's playing white. There's all sorts of lovely traditions. The way you hold the stone is a thing. Uh, yeah, so social uh, psychology actually makes it more challenging. I mean, if you look at someone with like a beard that looks like this guy looks like 400 years old, right? Therefore, he must have the <laughs> wisdom of Yoda, and he's slamming down pieces, and you're like, oh, I'm just you know, not even middle aged. So we have uh Rosel and uh, David hands up then we will yeah. uh, wrap up in about five uh five ten minutes so yeah um yeah I learned I first learned um go in my first freshman year of college and I prefer I've tried I've tried go online once and I immediately hated it I'm like <laughs> I like I think the its experience is like the the feel of the pieces and the sound of the board is just Great. a different experience and it adds to the experience. It's part of the experience of playing Go. And without that, you lose something. It's just not the same. But, I, I agree. 100%. Yeah, I, was, I, I thought it was funny that uh, the first time I learned Go, I played three times. And I... Uh, my third my third game i beat the other player but then the fourth game i got cocky and then lost again <laughs> so you really have oh. to so it's also like a really it will like, teach you humility you have, to, you have to really concentrate another proverb of go is lose your first 200 games <laughs> because you're going to you know you, you don't you don't get good at go without I, I like it. I wanted my children to learn it. My daughter has learned, but both my kids have played some because it will curb your perfectionist tendencies, which they get from me. You can't be perfect. And that's a lesson. <laughs> I heard, I was told that you can, it's, um, it's easy to learn. It's hard to master. You can take 15 minutes to learn to play and the rest of your life to learn to play well. Yep, but it's but it's easy from the beginning, and if you guys join back when we do it online here, you'll get a chance. Okay, uh, Dave, please. Name yeah, me. the Asian game I remember is for its noise is pachinko. Out in the street, there's little uh, enclosures of thirty or forty these vertical pachinko games, and these ball bearings go. That's a little click, 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 and I don't know how you, st but I mean, you're just addicted gamblers who sit there all day long and go crazy, I would think. Anyway, comment. 
Yeah, we don't need to have a section about Pachinko. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's a binomial distribution. Sorry, math teacher. <laughs> okay, uh, CK, please. Hi, uh, the, well, other than Wu uh, Quan, Wu Qingyuan, or Go Seigan, the only other Go master that I, I am aware of, because I don't really know that many people who are very good with uh, Go, uh, is Nie Wei Ping. So how good is he compared with uh, Wu Qingyuan? And another person called Lin Haifeng. Okay. Yes, yes, that one also, but, uh, you know, that slipped my mind. I I don't keep up with professional play that much. So I like I know some of the classics because I've I've read books about them, but I, I'm afraid I'm not the person to ask those those questions. I don't know that that many names either, honestly. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. So uh thank you very much. And the next week we will talk about AI. Are you going to uh deal with uh AlphaGo, that movie, Netflix movie? Uh, it will be mentioned. Yeah, I'll be talking about AlphaGo okay. in two in two weeks. In two um, weeks, yeah, because it's yeah. about two years ago, I have a session talking about that movie. Okay. Yeah. But right and now I we because at that time was very difficult because uh, uh first I watched the movie and then try to talk about this and then uh, uh because I I think you, you, you need to know the this game. Okay, to enjoy that movie, I think some minimal rule. Enjoy the movie. It's it's fascinating to watch for it in TV shows. In in most TV shows, they show the board and it's obviously crap. Like they they've never really played this game. They don't know what's going on at all. I saw recently the Netflix One Piece uh, live action show it had Go featured in it, and that one was interesting because the board had very plausible wow. shapes on it. But it was clear it was not a real game because there were none of those corner Joseki. Oh, you're, you're gonna you're gonna see those. The shapes were plausible, but again, it was clearly not a game. And then I this car, uh, carbon something frozen carbon. I can't remember the name of it. Carbon on Netflix. That one also featured Go, and that one was real. Like they made a game, they made a move, and you look at the board, and it was a sophisticated move. So it's 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 fun spectator sport in the in the West to to watch for it in movies and TV and be very judgy about how they uh, how they've represented the game. The game. Okay, great. In two weeks, we will see a, a better a better way to to understand uh, this. Alphabet. But I really like this movie. Put it right now. So, uh, uh, Rosel, please. Then we have probably have to wrap up. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I also put it in chat. So I have a folding Go board that I don't have pieces for. Um, it didn't come with pieces. Uh, where can I? I don't know where to get good. Um, like I don't want uh che too cheap. I don't want too expensive. Uh, for Go pieces. Start start with Yellow Mountain Imports. They, you know, I don't know that you can buy just stones from them, but they have good. Like not cheapy boards, but not super expensive boards. Um, oh, my board's that, in good shape. It has like a hinge in the middle, so it folds. Right, and if you do buy, try to buy, it's a little more difficult to buy just stones, and you'll want to make sure they're the right size. If you want to, uh, maybe put something in the in the. I think Jason's trying to close up here, but if you want to put something in the meetup chat. I'll um, I'll try to provide. Yeah, some or you can pleasure. send the um uh take the the meta message to me, and I will forward to Steve. Or you, you can. You know, I'll send. I have a link of a document that has that kind of information and other just general Go resources. I'll I'll okay. send a link to Jason, and he and he can he can post it out there. That would be great. I would try to if you want to meet out to reach out to me yeah. directly through Meetup, you you may certainly do so. I would be very happy to to help how I can. Okay. Okay. Uh, all you want to, uh, Steve, you want to. Okay. So I will, will deal with that. And then, uh, thank you very much, Steve. You have and I, one thing. I really thank you, Steve, because uh, this session bring me a lot of memory of my childhood. <laughs> Okay, and I know how I, I all of a sudden I understand how my grandpa and my grand uncle play the chess. They sometimes they put that dot, sometimes they move one line because of the reason, you know, because yeah, 
outside or inside. Sometimes they don't put exactly on that one. And I have a question, but they didn't give me a good answer. So until I hold it, this, <laughs> I have this in my mind for like 50 years. Until <laughs> so, Glad I can help, man. <laughs> but anyway, thank well, you. I hope you all enjoyed. I, I, it's a yeah. game I fell passionately in love with. It's 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 quite a, quite a game. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone. And uh, next week we will talk about uh, history, uh, a short history of uh, Chinese philosophy on the chapter one. And we are going to start a series on that. And uh, then uh, we have a more session and we'll come back. And thank you again, Steve, you know, for this wonderful section. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next week. Thank you all. Bye-bye.